no, no. Oh. I'm, and I've got to leave early. Uh, oh. I've got the foyer today in Gale South today, so uh -huh. I'll be there. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. Yes. Welcome to our um, people that are online. What an interesting Nobody there. Yeah. Yeah. We have a lot. I don't know what you're doing. This was actually supposed to be the last session uh, of this series, uh, but Brother Mike gave me a a dispensation for another week, so I'm going to try to finish up next week. So, uh, you mean we got to put up with you for another week? <laughs> <laughs> That's what my wife's been saying for 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> Your secrets are coming out, Bill. Uh, but welcome to the morning. You know what? Has God been good to you this week? Amen. Uh, yes. God is so good. <laughs> God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He session today we realize that you created this world and at the end of that creation you said it was good but we know that evil came in sin came in and as a result of that you allowed one family Noah and his family to remain on the earth to populate the next uh, generation dear heavenly father but again sin continues so as we go forward in your plan you sent your son and our savior a sacrifice to Heavenly Father for all of us. And we pray to Heavenly Father as we look into your word today and we think about the sacrifice that Paul made coming from being a persecutor of, uh, of Christians, dear Heavenly Father, in the way and to be an advocate and a defender of the faith. We're giving closer, dear Heavenly Father, to kind of the end of Paul's journeys and possibly the end of his life. So let us uh, enter into the study this morning with an open heart to think about the things that are going through as Paul uh, uh, takes a look at the Corinthian church and other churches in this third journey. Please forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, last week, we, uh, this is the area we covered. Paul had started on his third missionary journey, and this is his longest one, four years uh, for completion. Hopefully we'll finish that up today. We find uh, Apollos, who is one of the uh, uh, great orators, you might say, a charismatic guy, and he does such a great job and may have written one of the books in the Bible, possibly. I always look to my see, what that is. see the reaction I get there. It's kind of like saying Aquila and Priscilla versus Priscilla and Aquila, right? In terms of that part of it. But the key today and what we're going to look at is the letters that Paul writes to Corinth. Corinth was such a difficult uh, uh, church for Paul. He loved it. 
And you know how many times he went back and forth and wrote letters to them because they were so conflicted in so many different ways. And that's kind of what we're going to look at. We started with that last week, but we get into some pretty heavy stuff today. Things that I would love to go forward and discuss in more detail, but it's just not possible within the time frames that we have. Um, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to have a new uh, Christian message series coming out. Now, I'm going to address those issues, some of the issues that Paul was facing there, mainly the marriage issue and, and divorce and, and uh, marrying again issues uh, in that session. But today, what we want to think about here is that we've covered the divisions in the church, which we still have today, sexual purity, legalizing almost every one of the issues that face the Corinthian church is faced in some way, in some part, in all of our churches today, in some form or fashion of that particular um, uh, issues or the particular issues that Paul addresses. Um, turn over to 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter. That's obviously for the first few moments where we're going to begin. Uh, I'll uh, never forget, I've taught 1 Corinthians a couple of three times in my life. And when I get to the seventh chapter, most every time, I spend, I have spent at least three weeks on just the seventh chapter alone. And you, you know why, when you read, when you look at it and you see the issues that the, uh, the church was facing. We have to remember that this church was made up heavily of Gentiles and Jews, but they're different in culture. The, it was almost impossible for a Jewish woman to obtain a divorce. Almost impossible. But for Gentile women, it was really not a problem. The marriage questions from Corinth. There's six of them. People are going to more. There's discussion about some other things, but these are the main things that, that came up. The Corinthian brothers thought Paul was a male chauvinist relative to marriage. He was unqualified to speak on the subject since he had never been married. So Paul answered these six questions that came to him from some people from the church in Corinth when he was in Ephesus. Question, should married couples continue normal sexual relations after becoming Christians? Unverified, I mean a verified yes. It's their duty. Should single persons get married? Yes in all normal situations, but for some like myself, celibacy was advantageous, especially in unsettled times. We are in unsettled times. This is 30 years after the resurrection of Christ. You know that it, you know, as much as it came and grew, it also grew in the <laughs> way also. Different philosophies, different thoughts, different things were going on in the church. And especially when we integrated into, as we grafted, as the Bible says, the Gentiles grafted into the church in that period of time. The third question, is divorce permitted for Christian men? I put this question in here because uh, this is one of the biggest questions that the church has today and society in general, you might say, about divorce. I didn't put the word, I didn't put women in there. But look at the 11th verse, and somebody would read that, I'd appreciate it. The 11th verse, I believe it is there. Yes, uh, Jack, please. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment deceived me. No, it's not right. No, no, no. Uh, uh, there, uh, you're an astronaut, Jack, 1 Corinthians. First room. Oh, here. my goodness. Here. It's all right. You're good. Okay, you got it here? All right, here we go. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. Uh, again, wish we could get into a larger discussion of this, but at this point in time, we don't. But I don't know what your thoughts are on this. But um, if you look in Scripture and... I think I'm right about this. There's only a few places past Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that marriage is at all addressed in Scripture. 
First Corinthians 7 is basically the only place. Romans has a couple of things. Uh, and of course, we go back to uh, Matthew talks about an exception to the, uh, in the divorce area. But Mark and Luke do not mention exceptions. Didn't somewhere Jesus say yes, but it was not always so? I'm sorry, what? Didn't at one point, I don't remember the scripture, but Jesus said relative to divorce, yes, but it was not always so. In other words, basically, God, he said, Moses permitted it because your heart was hard. Right. Yeah, but it's it's not, yeah, complete restatement of the Old Testament doctrine because under Moses, that's what was the problem. But again, uh, I will, I'll address this in, in my Christian message series in the next uh, few weeks, but basically in the church, there are three Thank you. prominent views within the church concerning marriage, divorce, and marrying again. View number one, the age-old traditionalist view concerning a certain a Christian man and woman. A Christian man or woman can divorce and marry someone else only in the Lord if one spouse has committed adultery. It's called the one cause theory. However, the spouse that committed the adultery cannot marry another. View number two, a current liberal view. A Christian man or woman can divorce and marry someone else regardless of the reason and they have not seen it. I always mess it up. And then finally, view number three. A conservative view in our current. Christians cannot divorce and marry someone else for any reason or excuse. And I go to the 11th verse there, 10 and 11. Those, now those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband, but if she does leave him, let her remain single or else go back to him and the husband must not leave his wife. There are other views. Uh, different churches, different uh, groups, elderships, take different uh, positions. Most of the time, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's not a whole eldership, but it's some within the eldership has one view and some, within, and some other views, okay? So again, um, as much as I'd love to get in more detail here in discussion, and I'm sure you have some questions. If there's any specific thing you want to say something now, that's fine. It's just that time does not allow us to go into the details of what we're talking about here. But I'll try to address that, I said, in the next series, uh, Christian series, uh, message series that I have. But this is one of the issues. Is this not an issue that faces the church today? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, what do we think? Think about it. The divorce rate... For so-called Christians, and I use the word, this comes from a Barnum study, the most current one that I could find. 30% of people that, the evangelicals at about 28, Catholic church, Catholics at 28%, other Christian groups, it's hard to break them out within Barnum, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, surveys to break it into what we would like to break it into. But if you really, if I, everything I look at, the Church of Christ uh, writers do not address this very much, if any part of it. But um, people say, well, the, uh, the Christians divorce at the same rate as non Christians. It's not true. No, not even close. It's close to, it's close to 47, 46 to 47% in society that at least they have divorced at least one time in their life, all right? It's very hard to, to even do surveys now because so many people are just living together. They, they cohabitate. They don't have the marriage, okay, as far as a legal marriage. We know what marriage is for us and Christians. It's from whom? God. God, all right? even though we have to comply with state laws and regulations to be able to do this. But anyway, just, just kind of a tip of an iceberg here that we uh, I wanted to at least touch on, but um, there's, there was three other questions. Well, I'll try to get back. 
<coughs> Before you go to those, Bill, I had a question in your very first slide. And when you're talking about Paul being celibate, in unsettled times, what did, can you expound on what you mean by unsettled times? Yeah, uh, thinking about this at this point, all over uh, the empire and everything else, you remember in, in a short period of time, in 62 AD, Nero comes in. That's when he really comes into the to play. Now that plays in Paul and throughout the rest of the part of his life. But the unsettled times there is because of the unsettled times within the uh, groups of the Jews and the Gentiles. The, the unconverted Jews, the converted Jews, and the pagan Gentiles and the uh, Gentiles converted. And they had such a different culture. That was the unsettling times, in addition to the persecution that had certainly been intensified with that. Yes, sir. Oh, you just added it in. I was going to say that I believe that the, the main part of the unsettledness of it was the persecution yes. of the church. Yes, it was. Because it, we did pretty good for 30 years. I mean, if you look back at that time, 30 to 60 was a pretty solid time within the church. <clears throat> was coming all the time. Yes, there were issues. There were false teachers, and we'll go into that in just a minute. But it was fun. But as put a conglomerate, what's happening today in our society? What's causing so much uproar within peoples in our society? Right or wrong, the influx of what? So many different cultures coming in from South America, from uh, Asia, all of these places. Was that happening before? Yes, but it's so amplified now and it's causing so much distress for people involved with that in some way, form or fashion. Well, it's the same way of what was going on there. The influx into the church from different cultures. It's hard. I was in, uh, Sherry and I were in Germany for three years and uh, of course, I didn't speak German. It's cold and, uh, at all. A uh, few words here and there, but anyway. But trying to integrate into the German society for me was very difficult. Into the church there, even though the majority of the church there, where I was in the uh, army, were uh, were you know people that were in the army and things of that sort. But you had the German people there too. I spoke very little at that time. This is in, you know, I'm an ancient. So this is a, I'm more like a dinosaur age. I know. This was in the, in the lady, not my wife. She's right, still young. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course. yeah. She's still young. Yes. She's, oh. But you see how. So, so, uh, so, 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 I believe you said he had some kind of little little uh, surgery. So I apologize for not mentioning that, but he's such a, a key person involved in the church here and in, in our classes here. Uh, Troy, I missed your point. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just, it's all right. <laughs> I like that shirt. Oh, yeah, I, I, I wear that too. A lot of people say, I can wear pink. I can wear quite a color. It doesn't make you shirt out. Oh, okay. Well, that's, she did a good job. Yeah. Uh, Troy, it's pink. Well, Bill, uh, at least the best of my understanding, Richard, that's what I see going on in Troy A at the other piece. Yes, sir. I think that um, the gospel is for all, all cultures and all different people. Yes. And, and it goes beyond even just different cultures. It's the influx of humanism and man as the standard in all cultures. When that happens, then evil is called good and good is called evil. And that's happening here in our culture yes. more than it is anywhere in the world right now as far as changing. Yes. You know, if you if you speak against somebody becoming a transgender person or whatever, then you're the evil one. Yes. And they're the good one. And what that does is it's taking the standard and applying it to humanism. And it's more that than it is even a cultural difference. Yes. There's a lot of different cultures that are fine and accept the gospel, but when you say I'm the standard, then whatever I say goes. Mm. Well, I think your point's well taken. And then when we think about a 1%, not even up to 2% of our society seems to be controlling the direction we're going, yes. uh, at least from a media perspective. When you say that, and that's, uh, that's a difficult thing to accept too in terms of that part of it. But they were having a different period of time here in terms of what was going on in the church. Following that, 
The next question. When one partner of a pagan couple becomes a Christian, the other refuses to do so. Is such a marriage binding? Yes, unless the believer deserts the Christian partner. Applicable today. Unbeliever. 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 What did I say? Believer. Believer. Sorry. <clears throat> Unbeliever. Yeah. <laughs> Christian fathers had asked Paul if giving their unmarried young people of both sexes in marriage was a concern at this time. Paul, not the Lord, said that during the present crisis, it is good for all to remain as we are. Same kind of statement, Richard, relative to this present crisis. I've tried to look up this crisis thing, and y'all both hit on what it was and, and so forth, but it was just the uproar going on within this environment today in terms of that. You can see the fact that, um, do we see, uh, how many, do we see a lot of marriages uh, mentioned in, uh, Scripture, not mentioned. We see Christ doing his first miracle at a wedding, right? That he attended, mother, wife, things like that. So how many more can you remember? Not many, if any. There wasn't a lot of discussion about marriage during this period of time as far as actually biblical stuff that was going on. I mean, I keep wondering, were Jews then at this time starting to marry Gentiles? I don't know. But I had to see, I have to see that as part of the chaos that may have been going on at that time. Then the final question was, may a Christian widow remarry? Yes, provided she marries only in the Lord. Now, when you read the seventh chapter, you're going to see all these other things, talking about the virgins and things of that sort. Just too much to get into in terms of that within this space of what we're talking about here. Let's talk about Christian liberties. I think I'll put it up here before I meant to, but what's your understanding of Christian liberties? That was a big issue going on in the church there in Corinth. If you had to say what's your understanding of Christian, what do you think Christian liberties are? Can a Christian take liberty to do anything he or she wants to do? No. no. <clears throat> well, all right. Yes, sir. I would start with it's a Christian liberty only if it doesn't conflict with God's will for my life. If it, okay. if it follows God's will for my life, I can do whatever I want. Christian liberties are defined within the context, but in most cases today, it means Christians are free to do activities not expressly forbidden in the Bible. Most of these resolve, revolve around social do's and don'ts. Current examples, uh, whether or not certain <laughs> clothes to be worn, makeup, jewelry, tattoos, piercings, then doing certain other things such as smoking, vaping, social drinking, recreational gambling, or viewing certain rated movies or videos. There could be many, many more of these things, but these are issues that the church faces today. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, the expressly forbidden part, um, I, I don't, I might have an issue with that because oftentimes there are principles in the Bible that are given that, um, that speak to our conduct. Um, there are things that we would consider sin. I, I venture to say all of us would probably consider sin that are not mentioned in the Bible uh, expressly, but principally they are. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and, get, and so I mean, I yeah. just express. I'm it. not agreeing with this. Oh, this is just a. This was. This is a definition. Okay, okay. if you look at it today, I, I I certainly go right along with what you're saying. I'm just saying this is what the definition how it's defined today within that arena, and we think about <clears throat> certain things such. Now, and I'll go. I'm gonna go to one thing. Gambling. How much gambling do you see in the Bible? The soldiers uh, through lots, lots of Jesus is called. Right. The only one that I can see where actually something was taken as a result of it. Casting lots 
which I can believe to a certain extent. But within God's perspective, within Christ's perspective, when they cast lots to determine if it's going to be Barabbas or Barnabas, whatever his name was, starting with a B, and uh, or Matthias, okay? But when it fell, the Lord why? That's the one right there. So gambling is not for say mention. People want to bring up sometimes, oh, well, the Lord went into the temple and he threw all these money changers out of the way. Not gambling. There's no gambling. But that's what the people want. Even members of the church want to bring that. Oh, well, look what Christ did. For one thing, it's where it was being done. Yes, it was. And the temple it had nothing to do with what, what they were being done. That was done all over the place money changers and things like in the markets and pieces like that. So we don't want to get things out of context of what it is. Do I think gambling is an issue? Sure, I think gambling is an issue. I think a lot of these things are issues and things of that sort. But in today's society, I stuck in this word vaping. Uh, wouldn't have been in my original thoughts of this back a number of years ago, but that seems to be an issue that's facing our youngsters today and maybe not just youngsters. But you see these shops, vape shops all over the place. Mm -hmm. How many have you been into? <laughs> you didn't pick any? Oh, you don't go there. Oh, she, if she goes in, she's just going to get change. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. You should be divorced. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, again, we go along with a lot of these things. But all I'm pointing out is people today do know Troy. Some people strictly hold to the rule. If it ain't the Bible, I can do it to a certain extent. You know, it's ironic that they, in the Church of Christ, at least as far as what we do in the assembly, we do just the opposite. We say unless it's express, expressly authorized, I know. we don't do it. Yeah. It's just the opposite of that. But it's not, it's not, a, it's not universal when it comes to that, yeah. when it comes to that part of it. Now, Bill. Yes, ma'am. Something we're talking about Christian liberties. Where does, you know, we always say, don't let it be a stumbling block. Yes. So how does that factor you in? Kick, you kick right into it. You must see, you must see my slide, the next one. All right. Paul lays down five principles of Christian behavior. What is permissible behavior for one under certain circumstances or may under certain be dangerous and sinful to another. No Christian conduct should be evaluated solely from the standpoint of knowledge, but in the light of the love of brethren relative to its possible influence upon others and in the light of what others may think of. No Christian has a right to engage in an activity, however innocent it may seem, if in so doing they damage the faith of another, especially a weak member. It would be as if it's also done to Christ and that weakening or destroying of their faith is a sin against Christ himself. An indulgence which may be the ruin of someone else is not a pleasure, but a sin. Mm. Does that hit where you're talking about? Now, but I want you to be very clear about what you're seeing here. And I go back to a couple of what statements y'all made. Every point in here has a reference to what? If Chip is doing something out there in the Woods, wherever it is. Nobody else is seeing him, and he thinks it's okay, regardless of what it is. Is it okay? Well, it depends if <laughs> scripture says it's okay or not. But every bit of this is related to one thing. Are you going to affect another brother or sister with what you do? Every one of those behaviors. Isn't that the essence of it? Look at it. Every single one of them. Mm -hmm. Sinful to another. Influence somebody else, damage their faith, destroy or weaken their faith. There are things Those are the things that we're talking about here. Yes, ma'am. The, the way I'm understanding you saying this is that you're talking about only if it affects another Christian, but yeah, I think it, it also applies to anybody. If you if someone recognizes you as a Christian and you're yes. doing something and they say, oh, well, they're supposed to be a Christian, mm -hmm. you know, yes. I think it, if it marks their view of that as well. Yes, I, I think, I think you're totally right about that. 
but I'm just giving you an, uh, the, the, if you look at this, everything that Paul talks about, because what was he going through there? He was going through the issues facing that church as a result of a combination of this culture coming in, one having a pagan uh, uh, philosophy on life, okay, do anything. Remember we talked about earlier, they all, they thought, well, well, I'm supposed to become a Christian, I'm all right. My, I, all I have to worry about is my soul, well, I don't have to worry about my physical body, I do anything I want to, yes, go I, I think this tells us that things are not always as cut and dry as what we'd like them to be. Exactly. There, there, are, some, there are some gray areas. Um, I mean, the, the thing is, if, if you just try to come down, well, this is right, and this is wrong, and this is right all the time, and this is wrong all the time, you're going to have troubles. Yes, you are. Yeah. And that's why it comes down to you and your... Because it's not just me alone. Exactly. It's, 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 we're, we're, we're part of a community. And we, whether we want to or not, we, we have to do with each other. Yes, we do. I think that's what Paul's trying to teach here. I do too. I think you got to focus on the rest of your Christian family. Yeah, that, that's what he's addressing. Is okay. what you, even if your conscience says, hey, I can eat this meat. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, meat for idols. I did. That wasn't any problem for, for the Gentile group or for the pagan group at that time. And even though drinking blood or, or eating blood or drinking blood from animals, things of that sort. But it just wasn't a part of how Christ set up the church. There was what? One sacrifice. One sacrifice for everything. Yes. Well, I want to tell you all about a story about what Gail led me into one time. She oh, into the oh, baby. Oh. Oh. Thank you in the baby. Oh, no. <laughs> we were in Marathon in the Florida Keys where John was a high school teacher. Okay. But on Sunday, he was the preacher. And so Gail came down to visit me, and she wanted a rum cake. And <laughs> really good. <laughs> well, we have to go to the liquor store and get it. So we did. Mm -hmm. I thought John was going to have a coronary when well, he got home. He said, Did you guys get that? He said, Well, if so and so so you go in there. It never crossed our mind. But so and so might see us. <laughs> but I think, I think but that's your point cake, right here. Wasn't it? Is that if, if we can, we. You know, if, if you stay in a, in a convent, nobody knows exactly who you are or whatever, you go out. But if you're out in the social area and you deal with people on a daily basis, whatever it might be, and, and they recognize you through what your actions, through how you talk, through other possible, that you are a Christian, then they're going to look at you somewhat differently. I don't care what you say. They look, I've been, I play too much tennis. I see too many tennis guys. They come up to me and, and say, don't say anything, Bill Luther's around. I, I've literally heard that and uh, with guys who I play tennis with. And, and it makes me almost blush at times when something like that. But uh, but that that's how people do look at you. I, you could give examples, every one of you, I'm sure, on the job where you are, Rich, where you've been the same way. I mean, you've got guys in your arena who language is an issue sometimes with a lot of those kinds of people and things like that. I hope I'm not profiling, but, I, I, but I'm just trying to make a, a statement here about certain kinds of working environments where these kind of things can happen. Yes, Gil? I think that we all have a problem with making assumptions for what somebody might be doing. Mm -hmm. Like if you assumed yeah, that I was going true. in there to buy alcohol, you assumed, well, mm -hmm. if you assumed I was going in there for any other reason than to make my rum cake, you assumed wrong. And well, I thought somebody going just they say, going into Publix. Well, now Don't you go in there, they've got mm -hmm. wine in there for sale. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm, I'm just kidding. But all yeah. I'm pointing out is that there's yeah. where an assumptions can I be. I hate assumptions. Okay, let's move on a little bit. I'm. Uh, well, I, okay. where, I grew up, where I grew up, you weren't even allowed to eat rum cake. Right. <laughs> this was after your mom died. <laughs> just... The next group in, in, that he was concerned about is false <laughs> teachers. <laughs> Knowing that false teachers coming to the church, Paul had to defend himself again as a true apostle. They alleged that Paul supported himself, that he could not be a true apostle. I don't know where in the world they get this from, all right? Must be what they saw some of the others, maybe Peter or some of the others that were supported by the church in Jerusalem. But anyway, they come up with this as a reason he's not an apostle. But Paul unquestionably has these proofs. He's seen the Lord Jesus after his resurrection. He had taken his guidance directly from divine intervention. And God had marvelously blessed his apostleship and the Corinthian church being the proof of that. 
propriety and worship. Such an issue back then. <laughs> there are two different culture at odds. Jewish women under the old law could not participate in the synagogue assembly, but Greek women had more freedom, feeling equal and taking part with men in the meetings of the church. There were both public forums and, Christian, and church assemblies. Paul was trying to be very clear in his instructions with this. Women are not totally prohibited from speaking publicly in the church meeting, but disrupting the worship service with disorderly conduct was forbidden. On orderly worship, Paul told them that when they came together, the elements of singing, teaching, tongue speaking, and prophesying were to be done to edify the church. This is a command from God. Another area where you can get into and spend a great deal of time, all right, relative to what's the role of women, what can they do in churches, what can they do in certain assemblies, within meetings, within this, or within that. Again, not an area that we can get into detail with, but I just kind of want to throw these things out to you so you can rethink and look and see what your thoughts are about them in terms of that part. Yes, ma'am, you may make one Every comment. male member of the Church of Christ knows what uh, 1 Corinthians 11 says. Women are not allowed to speak in the church. But if they turn back to here, mm -hmm. Paul says, women told women, when you pray and prophesy, you know, the Bible identify. specifically prohibits women from being elders. There's no question about that. But well, there's a lot of questions deacon, about it, but not, not biblical questions. A lot of a, questions about it. A deacon is a servant. Yes. And women make good servants. Philip, who was one of the seven that was sent out by the first apostles, had four daughters who were deaconesses. Yes, they were. You know, pray and serve. I told Rita Thompson one day, I said, Rita, you may not be designated, but you are a deaconess. <laughs> Amen. You well, I'll tell you, I, uh, I'm in total agreement with you there, young lady, in terms of that part of it. Terminology is very important, I guess, sometimes. And it's just like saying pastor. I, I, every time I see on TV, uh, he's the pastor. Oh, he's an elder? Uh, I, but you know what the connotation is of pastor? What? Sure. Minister. No, I'm talking about in the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in the world, it, you know, he's the pastor of that church. He's the senior pastor, junior pastor, mm -hmm. children pastor, or whatever you want to call it. And that's, that's not with URE on it. That's with OR, I think, on the end of the pastor. But anyway, uh, just throw that out. Uh, my standpoint, uh, in terms of that. The issue was with, the main thing was with the Lord's Supper. We read in Scripture, and this is one of only the second two things, two areas that I remember where we talk about having the Lord's Supper actually prepared and used. The other one was Troas, is I correct about that? Troy may remember another one, he does bring it out, but that's the only two that I can remember. A fellowship meal was always eaten by the Christians in the early church. Now you say, well, okay, why don't we do that every Sunday here? We have homes to go to. These people were coming, that was a whole, if you want to call it a whole weekend, that was a Saturday, a Sunday, and all of that, that, they just stayed. That's what happened, all right? We'll talk about that part of it. But that was the culture of that environment to have a fellowship meal before. But what the Corinthian church was doing was mixing it with the Lord's Supper, and Paul says, you're now corrupting both of them. Not only the communication and the fellowship with the people as you're having a meal. The wealthy members within the, that had abundance of food didn't share with the poor. Some would even become drunk and then return home. Didn't even stay for all the other, all the activities that were going on. Even though the emblems of the Lord's Supper were distributed by each group, they did not eat as one. There was no fellowship being shared, circumventing the purpose of the Lord's Supper. Why do we have it together? To commune together, to be as part, as one, as you've all stated about the oneness of the of the church and the fellowship and why we why we want to try to be involved with each other as much as possible. Paul condemned all of these as self-indulgence, disregard of need of other, and shameless mixing of the Lord's Supper with a common meal. 
I think he eventually got the message over, but it took him a while to get there. Okay. We're now to the third letter of the church in Corinth, a letter not in the Bible. This is the letter that he wrote back after he received a report after he left back and went to Ephesus that the church was still in a, uh, deteriorating there. So he goes back to Corinth. But this was what he calls the painful visit. He failed to bring stability and came away disturbed, feeling he had failed in a direct confrontation with his opponents. Returning to Ephesus, he wrote a severe letter, the third letter, hoping to be successful in turning the naysayers around. Paul needed to unmask the false prophets, establish procedures for disciplinary action, and plead for a return to obedience. He asked Titus, who fully understand the issues there, to carry the letter back and report back to him in Troas. As we see, that does not happen because when Paul goes to Troas, Titus was not there, which worried him. So he went on and traveled to Philippi. Upon reaching Philippi, he was comforted by the arrival of Titus. Titus assured Paul the Corinthians expressed deep sorrow over the grief they had caused him. Paul regretted sending that severe letter, but sometimes when things go out to people and they actually change what they're doing, even though you might feel uncomfortable with how you've written it or how you state, stated it, when ministers uh, state things to their congregation and, and actually point out, you know, we may not be doing this right or we need to change or we need to do this or that. That's what Paul was trying to do. But when he got the information that they had repented, they started his obedience, zeal for him and punishment of the offenders gave him joy. So he was a joy that they had made a change within the group there. That letter, yes, sir. So yeah, I get the idea you're saying that he didn't really regret doing it, but he regret that he had to do it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I think that happens sometimes. Yes. Sometimes we have to, to have disciplinary actions taken by in our own lives, with our children, and things of that sort, but also within the church. The elders have to keep up with what's going on within the church so that they have a pulse of it to see if there's anything going on within the church that they need to address. It's not like you, the elders can't stick their head in the sand and just say, oh, I don't know, it'll go away. Kind of like a news cycle, right? Uh, you know, a lot of politics are a lot of things going on today. They say, oh, we're not going to worry too much about that. That's about a, a, a three day news cycle or something of that sort in terms of that part of it. Following the good news from Corinth, Pro Rock is 2 Corinthians. This is what you see here in terms of that. While writing, he learned that a strong minority was still causing trouble. So he shared revelations from the Lord that he had had in the vision 14 years ago. These revelations were offset by a thorn in the flesh the Lord gave Paul that would forever torment him, torment him. You may or may not agree with this next. Everything I've read, I come to this conclusion, but you know, it's not a, a big issue one way or the other from the standpoint of your, of your soul. That thorn in the flesh was not some crippling disease or disabling body ailment. It was the rejection of Christ by the chosen people and that's why the Lord did not remove it. Paul was so distraught that the people wouldn't accept Christ. And he wanted that to change. He asked the Lord three times to remove this, but it was not within the purpose of God to overrule the free will of those who elected not to accept Christ as their savior. Don't we have the same thing here? Mm -hmm. We have the free will to make a decision on whether we accept Christ or we do not accept Christ. That was the same thing. Christ did not want to force anybody to believe in him. He wanted them to come to him of their own free will, change their heart, and become Christ-like as much as possible. He was not going to go away from that. 
You know, he was just not good. Could Christ, what we hear the thing about Christ said, I could, he could have called 10,000 angels down. Sure, things he could have done. But that was not his mode. That was not what he wanted. He wanted us to love him as a part of our Christian life. He left Paul with words of comfort. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Hopefully we can finish up next week. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Oh, I have no idea. Okay, good. Do you have to finish now? Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't worry about it. I'll front it. I'm going to take the shower. Yeah. And then I'll let Are you join. I don't know. Nice to meet you. It'll probably be the easiest because I'm going to have to work. The lady that was with you. I think that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to take the shower. And I'm going to take the shower. And I'm going to take the shower. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, and if it's Carolyn. Uh, yeah. 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 Boys do. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, I know where you live. Yeah. Uh, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn and I are going to be gone next week. Thank you so much. Yeah, I know. Y'all have a safe trip. I know you're going to be, you're going to be gone about a week or so. Or? Okay. Keep us in your prayers. Yeah, I'll do that, Jim. Thank you. Um, now, is there family out there? Is that? Yeah.